In our pedaling show with Coach Hunter Green, we spoke of the tens of thousands of pedal strokes a Leadville racer will make over the entire course. Well, with all those revolutions going on, who are you going to trust to hold your shoes to your pedals? Uh, Shimano, obviously. (laughs) I always race in Shimano shoes and Shimano cleats and Shimano pedals. So the answer is pretty easy here. S-Fire, XTR, and SPD. Nice. And that is a great combo. Shimano shoes with its pedals and that universal cleat design. Of course, you, Fatty, are a dedicated Shimano guy. So it's no surprise you will be all Shimano on the pedaling side of things at Leadville. Yeah, Leadville and training and every other time. Uh, But something I've noticed, Hottie, that is pretty funny is racers who theoretically don't use Shimano. More often than not, still opt for Shimano pedals and cleats. That's how highly regarded Shimano is and how reliable Shimano is when it comes to clipping it. Yeah, I love those bike pics from a pro or someone pretending to be a pro, and they have their bike all kitted out using some other company stuff, and they're threaded into the cranks a pair of XTR pedals. Look, we really hope you line up at Leadville with Shimano everything. But if you decide to let someone else do the shifting, then please take our advice here and make sure you're turning those other branded cranks with Shimano pedals. You can see the entire Shimano pedal lineup at bike.shimano.com. And thanks, Shimano, for being the title sponsor of this show. Leadville, the podcast for the 100 mile mountain bike race presented by Shimano. It is season seven, episode 11 of the show that breaks down, builds up, gets you ready, and freaks you out for the highest, hardest one day mountain bike race in the country. I'm Michael Hotton, hotter to most. And I'm Eldon Nelson. It is our favorite day of the year, New Bike Day. In this episode, we're going shopping for a Leadville worthy ride. Ah, uh, I love New Bike Day. Hell, I love New Tire Day, New Chain Day, New Anything Day. <laughs> Hey, we spent a couple days roaming the grounds at Sea Otter looking for this bike. And of course, we came up with more than one. We got four to choose from. And here comes Eldon Nelson with 14 minutes to spare on that clock. The bragging rights and the heavy hardware. That's all you. Welcome back to your Leadville family and your finish line. So we know we need to get on a bike to get to the finish. And by the way, you must start and finish on the same bike at Leadville. But we also need a tip or two to get us back to 6th and Harrison. And Fatty, that's where you come in. Yep. And I like to title or at least theme out my tips, Adi. And for this one, I would call it belt and suspenders. Most racers rely on either their crew or the aid stations for fuel and fluid. And that's fine. However... Every year, there are a few racers who have missed connections. A crew can get lost or there can be congestion or a racer can be dazed and confused. That's happened to me and just blow right by your crew and never see them. So you want to have a plan B and a plan C just in case. Plan B for anyone using a crew is the neutral aid stations. The people there are super helpful and they want to see you finish almost as much as your crew does. And they are resourceful. You can't assume they'll have a tube or tools or anything, but it does not hurt to ask. Plan C is the real tip here, though. And that is something everyone should take advantage of, but I don't see a lot of people doing. There is literally no downside to dropping off drop bags the day before the race, including any special food items or drink mix that you want, emergency rain gear, a couple of tubes, and a multi-tool. So before you even head to Leadville, Buy a couple of extra large clear Ziploc style bags, load them up with the stuff you might need if you miss your crew or are just having a bad day. The Race Bible will have info on where and when you can drop them off and where and when you can pick them up after the race. And please note that the drop bags go only to Twin Lakes Dam and Pipeline. One used to go to the Columbine turnaround, but that's no longer the case. So if the sky is looking kind of dark and scary as you pull into one of the aid stations, 
grab what you need out of that drop bag and ride up, knowing that it is better to carry a few extra ounces up a mountain than to get soaked at 11 or 12,000 feet. Yeah, downhill at speed, wet, uh, no good. It's the worst. <laughs> yeah, great tips there, Fatty. Weather in the high mountains of Colorado can be incredibly unpredictable. Prepack your drop bags and have them in place just in case. We've spoken a lot on this show about gels and for good reason. If you are like most Leadville racers, you're going to go through a bunch of gels in training and on race day. So if you're new to gels and are still trying to find the right one, allow us to give you a little bit of gel knowledge, courtesy of our partners at The Feed. First, what we want you to do is sign up for The Feed's email newsletter. They always have some great info about products and athletes, and occasionally the Feeds team talks about gels. Like in a recent email, they got performance team member Ben Canute to break down some of his gels, like the ones he likes and the ones he doesn't like. First off, Enervit Liquid Gel. I've tried this one. If you hate thick gels, this one is very liquidy, easy to get down. Never second, Fruit Punch. It's tart with an amazing taste, plus 200 milligrams of sodium. There's Morton Gel 100 Rocket Fuel, Ben's favorite gel with 100 milligrams of caffeine, 25 grams of carbs. Untapped coffee-inspired maple syrup. Ben says maple syrup forward with an aftertaste of coffee. Great for cold winter rides when you need a little extra kick. Finally, SIS Beta Fuel. The team says definitely on the sweeter side. There you go, Fatty, a little gel intel. You know, I have been trying a lot of different gels lately, Hottie, and I've tried actually most, if not all of these, and my opinion sometimes tracks with Ben's here, and sometimes it's different. Um, the Martin gels in particular, the the 100, uh, 100 uh, what he's calling rocket fuel, I keep one of those in my jersey, but only one, because it is truly an emergency debonking tool. With It is amazing. Um but don't use more than a couple of them per day. A hundred milligrams of caffeine is no joke. And a couple of those back to back could easily affect your gut and your ability to sleep that night. Uh, also, let me point out that you will likely need gels for let bill. And for sure, you're going to want that choice made well before the race. The feed can help you with that decision. So go to thefeed.com slash leadville. Sign up for the newsletter, and if you do buy something, remember to claim your $80 annual credit. You do that by registering your email, verifying your phone number, and you can spend your first feed credit of 20 bucks right away. It is Christmas morning here on the podcast, and under the tree is not one but four bikes, all of which Hottie Claus thinks you could ride at Leadville. Yeah, this is by no means a complete list. These are four bikes we found at Sea Otter that fit the bill. We have two full suspensions and two hardtails. We have a super high-end machine with a price tag to match and something much more budget-friendly. Let's start with the best of the best. It is the latest from Specialized, the Epic 8. The S-Works model comes in at $14,500 full retail. We talked to the head of mountain bikes at Specialized, Brian Gordon, about this machine and how it slots in with the others that flash the big S on the head tube. Okay, we're back with Brian Gordon, a year later at Sea Otter, and uh, another new bike for Specialized, <laughs> and another great one. Another one that looks Leadville-worthy, but we're gonna try and clear that up with Brian right now. First, Brian, let's talk about your new machine, the Epic 8, the especially that S-Works version, which is a crazy good-looking bike. Tell me your thinking behind that bike, what you wanted to accomplish with it. Yeah, so when we came out with Epic World Cup in the past, we really focused on like short, punchy, explosive style of racing. It also happened to suit Leadville really well because Leadville traditionally, some have regarded it as a hardtail course. So since the bike is so light and efficient, it works really well there. We're kind of on the flip side of that um, in the XC spectrum, we have this like really rugged marathon racing and we're thinking more like stage racing, like Breck Epic or the Cape Epic or something like that. So we were looking at more travel, more capability, just like what you would need to do a big long race, multiple days, you're racing day in, day out, super long. You need comfort, you need control, um, you need capability because you don't have a chance to pre-ride the course, you know, hundreds of times or whatever it might be as you're going to these venues um, week after, or, you know, every year uh, in the XEO circuit. That's where like the Epic World Cup really shines because you have chance to get your line styled. Um, you need to have capability to go fast, but 
you're not getting as many surprises on those courses where in marathon racing you are because yeah. someone racing Leadville might not have a chance to even see what it's like to go down Columbine with riders coming back at you the other direction or whatever it is. So um, that's where the Epic will be good. It'll give riders that a little bit extra capability. Um, the bike is still incredibly light, not quite as light as the World Cup, but um, still plenty light to get you through the course and incredibly efficient too for the amount of travel that it has. Yeah. What we see at Leadville quite a bit or have seen in years past is people r racing the previous version of the Epic Evo. Would you now say, and we're talking about citizen racers, right? Like people yeah. out there for 10, 11, 12 hours, they, they love that bike, not only because they can race at Leadville, they could race it otherwise. Would you say that the Epic 8, especially considering what you've done with the Evo, the Evo's now more mm -hmm. capable, more trail-worthy type bike, would you say now that the Epic 8 is is that bike for those those citizen racers? Yeah, that is a really good point. So we actually went back and forth on even calling the new, you know, the bike with the 130 fork and the code brakes and the bigger tires. We even went back and forth calling it, calling it an Evo because there were so many riders that were loving the Epic Evo as a race bike for races like Leadville. So now going forward, you could almost think of the new Epic 8 as like that Evo race. We had riders in the past buying Epic Evo. Some were kind of turning it into this like down country, trail, slaying machine, whatever you want to call it. Others were taking it and turning it into something that was race ready and racing local cross country series, races like Leadville, Sea Otter, like this week. Um, and they were taking that Evo and turning it into a race bike. And that's what we did with Epic 8 was really make that 120 platform race ready. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Uh, so let's get back to that Epic 8. The S-Works in particular is a fantastic looking machine. And that bike previously had the S-Work version was a was a brain bike, and it had the brain suspension. Now you've gone with flight attendant. Tell me what you asked of RockShox to make flight attendant proper for that bike, and, and in general, describe how it works for the rider. Right. Yeah. So, in just kind of going back, we've constantly been getting market feedback on brain and just modern suspension solutions, and understanding how riders are using suspension on today's stage and you know in the past coming off of hardtails it was like make the shock move as little as possible i wanted to just absorb the big bumps and that's about it where now riders are like diving into compression tuning adjusting volume tokens in the shock um you know progressive rebound tunes are coming along so it's all these like really nuanced things and really taking advantage of what suspension can deliver so we were getting feedback that riders love the brain because they didn't have to adjust it all the time but they wish that they could adjust it sometimes. So it's a super interesting thing where you're like, okay, you want the brain so you don't have to fiddle with the remote lever all the time. But there are certain situations like the sprint at the start of a cross country race or the finish or um, a super long downhill, like going down Columbine where you might want to just open it all the way up and get the most comfort that you can. So that's where we kind of came up with a solution where we need a, a setting on the on the suspension that you could ride all the time, but we need these polar opposite fully open or fully locked modes as an option. So starting with that, we kind of developed these three tunes and that was like our baseline. And that's what you actually find all the way down to the comp level of the Epic 8. So you're getting that fully open mode, the magic middle we're calling it, which rides a lot like brain. It's a really digressive compression tune. So it creates a lot of low speed compression and really supports the rider under pedaling, gives you a lot of chassis control. But when you hit a big impact and you have a really high shaft speed, the compression actually tapers down rather than progressing like a normal damper would. So that allows the shock to move freely under those high speeds. So in the way it works like brain where it's reacting to the bigger bumps, but it's kind of um, tuning out those little small chatters and giving the rider more support. Um, and then on the, on the flip side of that, the full, the full lock mode and the full open mode really help uh, complement it. If I get flight attendant, if I go all out, with the S works, totally. what am I getting into then? So with flight attendant, you get those same three settings, but it's automatically toggled through through the flight attendant system. And so flight attendant is really unique where it's taking inputs from the rider and the terrain through all the other axis components. It knows how hard you're pedaling. It knows if you're climbing, descending, what gear you're in, all of those things. And once, once it can calculate all that, it'll put you in the right mode. The other really unique thing about flight attendant is like, with a standard remote system, you're toggling through the three positions and you're adjusting the fork and the shock together. Flight attendant can do split state. So if you're on a really technical climb, it could put the rear shock in the pedal mode and leave the fork open, something like that. So it's pretty unique. It's really impressive. Our cross country team is loving it, having tons of success. So really stoked to introduce that on that S-Works level.
So give us a use case then. Like say you, you went to Leadville and you decided to ride the Epic 8 S-Works. How long or how much course riding do you figure you would have to do to give flight attendant a good understanding of what you're up against for race day? I think if you can get on a flight attendant system, you know, for a 30 minute ride, you'll really understand what it's doing. And that's about how long flight attendant takes to kind of learn what you do as a rider. So they have this cool technology called adaptive ride dynamics, where the system actually learns you as you ride it. It understands what your effort levels are going to look like based on how much time you spend at each power zone and it's reading the power meter. So when it does that, it, it can kind of guess where your threshold might be or where your sprint might be. And then when you're out riding, it's going to actually do different things based on what effort level you're in. If you're just out cruising along or you're on Leadville, you're at 10,000 feet, you're riding 180 watts up the climb because that's can't breathe, you know, um, it's going to put you in an appropriate setting versus if you're sprinting here at sea otter at sea level and you're in the really high power zones it's going to make the system ride a little bit more firm and give you that extra efficiency whereas if you're just out cruising it's not going to beat you up so it'll kind of bias towards a softer more comfortable setting again no i want to put you in the scenario so if you oh, were yeah. on the epic eight yeah. with flight attendant would you would you take it out to kevin's or maybe try to do that power line descent and, and give it an understanding of you know, how you are responding and what kind of conditions you have. Is that, does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, I think so. To be honest with you, I think, I think what you're asking is like, what's the most important way to experience flight attendant to understand what it does? Yeah. And you get it to respond the way I want it to respond. Cause I, I get the feeling it, it can keep uh, adjusting as I keep taking the bike into different conditions or obviously at yeah. Leadville where I'm gonna not be as, <laughs> right? Yeah. My performance is gonna drop. Yeah. I. I don't think that there will be a, such a big swing okay. by if you're like, even if you're training at sea level and then you go to Leadville and you're riding at those lower power zones, one, the thing will learn as you go. So even if you just do those two training rides, when you get to Leadville, it's going to already start to reprogram what your power numbers are in the system. Um, to understand what flight attendant does and to like get a feel for how it's going to perform. I think that section after the pipeline speed zone where it's really undulating terrain. You're climbing, you're riding along the flats, you're descending, there's all this little rock in the ground. I think that that is where flight attendant kind of shines and it's it's more active. When you're just sitting and grinding up Columbine for an hour, it's gonna mostly be in pedal and lock. It's not gonna be changing modes the whole time. But when you're on that rolling terrain, even like here at Sea Otter, the system's just gonna be changing suspension all the time and putting you in the right mode. and you're not gonna be able to keep up with it. It's gonna change probably 10 times the amount that a rider would change if they had a mechanical remote on the bar and they were changing modes. All right, I'm gonna give the audience a, a break now okay. with the flight attendant talk. That's really nerdy stuff, I love it. What else did you do to the Epic 8 that people should know about? That, that's gonna make it stand out over the previous models you had. Yeah, so I think the big the big thing is just the full shift in what we've done with the travel and geometry. If you're coming off the brain bike, it's a big change. Um, it's going to give the riders a ton more capability, a ton more comfort on the downhills. But beyond that, we also really focus on efficiency. When we kind of like envisioned this bike, the number one priority was pedaling response. Mm -hmm. So while we were you know doing things like adding making it more trail capable we were by no means detracting from the efficiency side and we even improved that over the last bike through optimizing kinematics and anti-squat a really cool thing that i don't think got said enough in the media in the marketing is what we were able to do with the geometry we really have this cool dynamic geometry effect through the kinematics where when a rider is pedaling the bike is held up significantly more than the previous epic evo so you don't get such like a squatting feel. Two things that it does is it allows riders to potentially use their lock less if they want, like if they're climbing a technical terrain because the, the attitude of the bike will hold them up. They won't need to lock it out just to prevent the squatting in the back. Um, and then it also allowed us to get away with lower geometry. So we were able to reduce the bottom bracket height, give riders the benefits of a low bottom bracket height, lower center of gravity on the downhills, but they don't get the negatives on the climbs because they're pedaling and that bike is being held up so much more. So yeah, I think that, that geometry, just the way we shifted it is really important, but also the way that the suspension kinematics play on that and allowed us to go even farther than we would have um, 
because when you're pedaling up twisty climbs, technical rock stuff, whatever it is, you're getting a little bit steeper geometry set that allows the, ride, the bike to be more nimble than a bike as slack as that thing is on paper. And those response characteristics go all the way down to the comp level on the new Epic 8? Yeah, the kinematics, the shock tuning, all of that carries all the way through. And we worked really hard with Rock Shocks actually to get pricing that would work for us so we could deliver that magic middle mode on the comp model. That was really important for us to get that benefit to all the riders that are buying the Epic 8. Back to the YesWorks, uh, the specs on the far as componentry, are there any huge surprises there? I mean, obviously you're SRAM, you're going one by, big pie plate in the back, right, for climbing, mm -hmm. Roval wheels, am I missing anything there? Yeah, I think uh, some of the under the radar stuff that people don't realize is the bike, the wheels come with ceramic bearings. So, you know, again, focusing on efficiency and giving racers what they want. It comes with the one piece carbon cockpit from Revolt that we introduced on the Epic World Cup. Um, it's full axis components, so XX SL transmission, uh, axis seat posts, all of that. So full wireless. Um, and then the bike comes equipped with a power meter right out of the box. So I think racers want to meter their powers. They get Leadville. It's pretty important to know what you're doing because it's really easy to go hard on that first climb and then pay for it for the next eight hours. <laughs> so um, it's really good to just have that data when you're racing, especially a race like that. And a dropper. Oh yeah, all, all the Epic 8 models now come with a dropper post. So that's also new uh, down to the comp model. So we understand cross country riders want droppers these days and we're, we're here to surf. All right, Brian, let's buy a bike. Um, let's say, first of all, well, it's you. Now that you've, right, you you were behind the World Cup. Fantastic bike. Had a huge UCI World Cup winner to Christopher Blevins recently. Uh, it's here at Sea Otter being raced right now. Um, and you've also the man behind the Epic 8. Pick your bike. You're going to Leadville. What are you going to ride? Personally, I think I would go Epic World Cup at Leadville. And the reason being is you can get away with we can get away with that bike because of the technicality of the course. The suspension on the Epic World Cup works great. And since you have such long climbs, the Epic World Cup, I think even does a better job of holding the rider up. Um, obviously with 75 mils of travel, it's easier to manage that. Um, but then the weight is kind of the biggest driver. Okay. So yeah, it uses a smaller fork chassis. It's a lighter weight frame. Um, yeah, I think I think that's what I would choose for Leadville specifically. If you're buying one bike and you're not only racing Leadville, though, you're racing your local series. Maybe you live in Utah or you live in Texas, wherever. The Epic 8 is probably the most versatile cross country bike that I know of right now in terms of like you can go and race Leadville, which is mostly fire roads. You could go do a short track race on it. You could go on a you know a trip to tahoe ride with your friends on some trails like it's you can pretty much take it wherever you want it has the swat storage it has so many other features that a rider might appreciate if they can only afford one fourteen thousand dollar bike okay let's <laughs> talk to the 10 to 12 hour racer many of whom love the epic evo currently what are you going to put that racer on yeah if the rider is going to be out there all day 10 to 12 hour race time is going to wear you down for sure so having those three settings of the epic eight might be a benefit that rider might you know if they're not on flight attendant they might find themselves riding in the magic middle in the lock through those first four hours of the race but then when they the fatigue starts to set in even that section i mentioned near the pipeline feed where you're just on that flat rolling terrain there's a little bit of washboard a little embedded rock the open mode is going to pedal really well but give the rider more comfort so their body is not going to get as fatigued well, Brian, I think you're, this is proving, again, the evolution of the full suspension bike. I mean, they've just gotten so much better, right? I mean, they've gotten so good that it's really difficult now to, to ignore them for a race, even a long event like Leadville. That's how good they've gotten. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, I think the days of the hardtail being the best bike for all the racers at Leadville are maybe over. Obviously, we've got riders like Keegan that are going super fast on hardtails, but they're young and fast and they're only racing for like six hours, so that's not even an endurance race at that point. Yeah, right. Well, Brian, congrats on the Epic 8 and the World Cup and all of it, and uh, thanks for talking to us. Of course, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Okay, two great choices from Specialized, but as we continue to learn, one of the big hurdles for the new racer at Leadville is bike handling. So in that case, the Epic 8 is likely the right choice. Right. There are pro and expert levels of that bike that can get to you below the $10,000 mark, by the way, the Epic 8 has two water bottle mounts, so good for the packless racer. Okay, on to another full suspension bike and another well-known brand, and that is Giant. 
lifetime Grand Prix racer Cole Patton rides giant, but I feel like the brand is not as recognized as a Leadville race bike, but it should be. We got with Andrew Jaskaitis, giant global marketing manager, to pick out the giant for Leadville. We are looking for a cross-country bike, race bike, for the Leadville Trail 100. And the person we're trying to keep in mind is that possibly that, that first-timer or maybe somebody back for their second time. They're not looking to scorch the race course. They're looking to get it done, hopefully get a buckle of the giant lineup. Tell me where you're going to point me in your lineup of bikes. Yeah, if I'm, I'm going to walk you through the line in terms of product, that would be ideal for Leadville. And, and I mentioned to you earlier, you know, I live in Colorado. I've been to Leadville a couple of times. I've seen the races. I've crewed for the race. I'm familiar with it. I am not an experienced racer at Leadville. That said, the two products that I would really kind of think about in our product line that would be possibly right, depending on you know, how you want to pick your poison for your listeners. We offer a, a full hardtail line, both aluminum and composite, called XTC. It's, it's been in our lineup for ever. It's a great hardtail, reasonably light. Um, the geometry is pretty spot on, 100 millimeters of front travel. But really for that rider, you know, who has the goal of simply finishing the event, maybe, you know, beating their time from last year, who, who has a family who's training like a reasonable amount, who wants to do their best, I would put them in the direction of Anthem. Anthem is our latest cross-country racing product line. Um, Anthem is a full composite 29er, that's 29 front and rear. Has 110 millimeters of front suspension and 100 millimeters of what we call our maestro rear suspension. Why I like it and why I think your listeners might like it, um, the options here available in the United States have the option for full lockout. So on that climb which is most of the day, as you know, um, you could spend fully locked out, meaning you're not going to lose efficiency in the product. But when you get to the top, you turn around, you're coming back down, you're heading back towards the finish line, which in and of itself is a long day. Unlock the suspension. You have fully active, independent suspension from mm -hmm. Maestro. Mm -hmm. So how deep of a line is Anthem? Like how many different models can I find in Anthem, depending on you know, like how much, how big my budget is? Yeah, it depends on kind of time of year. But in the United States, there's a limited product line. I think when I last checked, there are three different price points. And I think we're starting around the $4,500 price point, And you might find something in your shop that goes up from there. I think if you want to spend nine, maybe even 10 grand, we still have some of those models left. The more important answer to that very good question is all of the these price points share the exact same frame so you're getting different componentry on them at that forty five hundred dollar price point it's the exact same frame as that call it or seven or eight thousand dollar price point it's just with different componentry so even if you wanted to go the frame set offering and build up your custom anthem exactly with the parts that work for you and your needs you can go ahead and buy that frame set. I think that frame set retails for around $3,200 for just the frame set itself, but it's a custom color, limited edition, super cool. Uh -huh. Are these bikes SRAM bikes? Shimano bikes, how do you folks spend? You, you name it, you know, looking at our brand, there's over five, there are over 532 bikes in our line. So um, it, it's not fair to say that we're only catering towards the Fox crew or the SRAM crew. Honestly, our category managers who build out our mountain bike line have the opportunity and ability because we're such a big company to pick and choose the products and componentry that works right. For example, on many of our products, you're going to see a SRAM drivetrain with Shimano brakes, which in our opinion currently right now is the best of both worlds. Yeah. Um, so it's the Anthem. You would point people primarily towards the Anthem. Uh, there's a woman's version to the Anthem too. We, some people are familiar with the Live line. So there's a, there's a woman's version? Yeah. So we have a sister brand called Live, And in that product line, really the, the angle with Live is that it is custom geometry for women. It is not the exact same product as Anthem. It is a different bicycle. But it's in the same realm and it's called Peak. Peak is a recent launch. I think they launched it about a month ago. Um, it has a little bit more travel up front. I, th I believe it's 120 up front and 120 in the rear. Um, so it's a little bit longer travel and women's specific geometry. So you can look into the details. You can find all of that on our website in terms of price point. It's an awesome bike. Okay. It's an awesome bike, but, but it's slightly more travel than our current Anthem. Otherwise, it's the same idea as the Anthem as far as performance goes. That's exactly right. Yeah. Currently, our women's World Cup cross-country racers are racing on that product, but I also see it fitting into um, the Leadville crew. Mm -hmm. So you've been to Leadville uh, and seen what it offers so give me your impressions what do you think you know you, you see I, I believe i believe my opinion is that you know there's two kinds of folks out there for that long day and those are those people who are not traditional mountain bikers 
um, who do have that fitness, who do have that training, but are goal minded, whether, you know, whatever, whatever belt buckle you want, whatever your time was last year, you're trying to beat that time. You're not going to win the event. Maybe you're not even going to win your category, but you do want to better yourself and you're out there and you're practically alone most of the day. And so you want to have the best equipment to make sure that when you do your turnaround, when you're coming back down, that you're fresh enough to handle those high speed descents to handle that rough terrain to get it back to the finish line faster than you did it last year <laughs> and safely yeah there's in years past and even to this day there's always this hardtail versus full suspension argument surrounding the leadville trail 100 and i suppose for the person just jumping into the race they're thinking i want the lightest bike i can get on i want to be able to climb why andrew would you steer them or at least try to point them towards something like the Anthem as opposed to what seems like on paper is the right choice? Great question, because if this was five, certainly 10 years ago, the answer would have been a hardtail because full suspension, to be quite frank with you in the audience, wasn't great. We've come so far, not just Giant. I mean, look at all the competitors' brands around here. We're, we are all doing a very good job at minimal weight and incredible efficiency and performance out of a full suspension bike. On the World Cup level of mountain bike racing, hardtails are dead. They cannot, and nobody races a hardtail because the courses are getting so technical, so demanding. It's really hard out there. With Leadville, it's a different story, but the answer to your question is, is full suspension, I would suggest that our Anthem is the best, but certainly a lot of the other products out here is so good that it effectively invalidates the need for a hardtail. Hmm. Uh Everyone will look at your how much your bikes weigh, and I I don't imagine you have the specs memorized, or maybe you do, but can you say at least we're competitive or we're the best, or how would you rate your the weight war in yeah, Giant? Yeah, I'll, I'll be I'll be very frank with with you and your audience. We do not have currently we do not have the lightest cross country full suspension bike frame out there in the market. We are certainly com competitive. But some of our uh, the other brands that you're seeing today, um, I, I don't need to mention those brands because I'm sure everyone's familiar with them, they do offer bikes that are lighter. That said, there's no such thing as a free lunch. When, when, when you start to get to those extremely light weights, you're looking at two trade-offs. Number one is suspension performance. If you're going to haul around a little bit of extra weight, you want to make sure that it performs well. I would argue that our Anthem is the best performing full suspension bike out there, cross country. Um, so you're going to save a little bit of weight with those other brands, but you're going to sacrifice the overall performance of the suspension. We don't see that as being a great trade-off. That's why we're not heading in the direction of those ultra lightweight cross-country racing bikes. Um, and then the second thing you know you need to think about is obviously people are spending a lot of money on these products. They want them, of course, to be safe, but they also want them to be durable and, and they're relatively maintenance-free. Our product needs to be looked after like a lot of other bikes, but isn't so finicky, isn't so incredibly lightweight that it's gonna wear out in one season. If you wanna have a bike that lasts, that has an outstanding warranty behind it, that won't let you down if conditions get extremely rough or get conditions get extremely muddy or whatever the conditions you ride in, season after season, Anthem is a great choice. Uh, do you consider it a compliment or, <laughs> or does it need correcting? And I've said this about Giant before, when people ask me, well, what bike should I buy? Where should I go? I always say, if you want the most bike for your dollar, you definitely want to check out Giant because if you want to look to like upgrade to the next level, you're, you're, the best chance you have to do that is with Giant. Is that a compliment or would you like to correct that? It is both. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, I, I've been with the company for 19 years. I heard that on my very first day on the job, <laughs> you know, that Giant is the value brand. Um, and I've spent the last 19 years of my life working on performance, performance road, performance gravel, performance mountain, to make sure that customers, such as the folks listening to the podcast right now, are aware and become believers in the capability of Giant as a high performance brand. So my answer to that question is, I'm gonna take it as a compliment because I'm in marketing, I'll take it as a compliment. And, and I will say this, is that we offer, I would say the best of both worlds. If you are that elite level athlete, if you have that elite level goal of doing the absolute best you can at Leadville and you want the very best bike under your butt to make sure to get you up and back down faster than you've ever done it before, I would strongly suggest you look at Giant and I would strongly suggest you look at Anthem. If you also are in the market for bikes for your family or for a very affordable fo form of, of Anthem as well, we offer that range. Nobody, like I said, 532 bikes in the line this year. Nobody offer, offers the depth 
and breadth that Giant offers. Mm -hmm. But the, your pricing, the reason you're able to do that is because you own the factory, right? I mean, that, that has a large part to, to, to do with why you can be so competitive. Great point. So yes, we are the only major manufacturer that produces our own products. If you were having this conversation with one of our other brands that you are standing here at Sea Otter, there are many other brands. Um, none of those other major brands have their own factory. They simply farm out their designs to factories throughout Asia to make sure that they're built. We control the process from bare thread of carbon fiber all the way to the finished frame. That means we control the design, the engineering, and we control the manufacturing. So not only do we have control in terms of the quality of the product, but we're also to do it at a price that's a little bit more affordable than our competitors. Okay, one more note on Anthem. If I get on an Anthem, a, what should I be kind of feeling for? How, what are some of the characteristics that might be unique to it? Because XC bikes, some of them can be kind of generic. You're like, well, it's just an XC bike. So what am I looking for in, in an Anthem when I get on it? How will it stand out from the rest? Great. Of course, two things, anytime anyone throws a leg over any bike is number one, is the fit. Obviously, you want to make sure that the fit, the bike, the, the top two dimensions, the reach, the stack, everything is right because you're going to be spending a lot of time on this product and certainly you're going to be racing a lot of time on this product. I don't care what brand you're looking at, make sure you feel comfortable on that bike. Hardtail, softtail, I don't care what it is, make sure you, you feel comfortable on it. Of course, that said, things you're going to feel or the thing you're going to feel on Anthem is, is the suspension performance. Like I said, and everyone's aware of this, a lot of our competitors offer quote unquote full suspension cross country bikes. The suspension is barely there. It barely functions. It might, it might only operate if it hits a certain size bump. With Anthem, if you get a chance to test ride it or demo the bike, go out on a regular mountain bike trail and experience the overall ride quality of it. You're gonna feel it working. And that's what we really love about our Maestro suspension, when, and that's what you're also gonna feel on our, on our Anthem series, which offers a, kind of a lighter weight version of the Maestro suspension. Okay, good. Andrew, thanks for pointing us to a bike. We hope someday we might see uh more of on the Leadville course and see you maybe out yeah, there again. fantastic I look forward I'll be there at Leadville this year I'll be cheering on you know I, I know you're not gonna be competing this year but I hopefully you see you on the sidelines and uh, wishing everyone a, a successful and safe race so giant is in the middle of transitioning to the new model year so check with dealers to see what is available one of the great things about the giant anthem is that all models come with carbon wheels even the 400 uh, 4500 dollar model you can also get a frame set and build your own. And hats off here to Andrew for being honest about the weight wars and Giant not being blinded by having the lightest bike possible. That is refreshing. And one more note on Giant Fatty, uh, that Anthem has just one water bottle cage mount, so be advised there, you may have to wear a pack if you're gonna plan to ride that bike. You know, Hadi, one of the guests we've had this season, Camp of Champions coach Ray Landry, brought up a really good point about being prepared for on-trail incidents. Ray said one of his Leadville DNFs was due to not being able to deal with a flat. Specifically, he said he struggled to remount his tubeless tire. Yeah, one of the hardest parts of dealing with a flat on a tubeless tire system is getting the bead back over the rim. Envy has designed in all of its rims a center channel that is there to help with this remount. Once you get the first part of the bead over the rim, you want to start placing the bead towards the center of the rim and into this channel. The channel effectively makes the rim smaller in diameter while you continue to push the rest of the bead over the rim. When done correctly, most mountain bike tires on an Envy rim should go on by hand. No tire lever needed. Yep, and then as you add air, the bead will climb out of the channel and onto the bead shelf, and you should hear the bead pop into place. Envy knows that flats suck, and that's why Envy was one of the first to go to hookless beads on carbon mountain bike wheels to prevent pinch flats. But if you do get a flat and you have to remove that tire, remember that center channel for the remount, it'll save you a lot of headaches and maybe some time at Leadville. Check out the entire Envy wheel lineup at Envy. That's E-N-V-E dot com. You know, in my years of club cycling. One of the biggest hassles was getting kits done. Oh my, the designs, the sponsors, the colors, the fabrics and size runs. Add to that the egos involved. And in the end, you'd almost rather ride on a t-shirt and cut off jeans. <laughs> it sounds like your cycling clubs did not know about DNA cycling. 
DNA takes all of that hassle out of custom kit design and ordering. For instance, one of your previous clubs and all its colors and logos, you could have just turned all of that over to DNA and its designers could have cranked out some amazing samples for your club to review. Once everyone likes what they see, DNA can open up the store, handle all the orders and get the kits to the writers. There's nothing hard about that. That does sound a lot better than the three ring clothing circus some of my clubs would go through. And now that I've had the DNA experience, it would be the first thing I would suggest to a cycling club or anyone wanting to do custom, get hooked up with DNA. And by the way, if you want to ride and cut offs in a t-shirt, consider DNA as well because DNA does t-shirts. That's right, they do. You and your cycling club can check out DNA's custom program by going to dnacycling.com. Most of my trips around Leadville have been on a hardtail, and I'm planning to race hardtail again this year. The hardtail is, however, no longer the obvious choice, but it is still definitely a viable one. That's right. We have a couple to choose from as we go bike shopping for a Leadville machine. We start with a Leadville winner, 22 champ Hannah Otto crossed first aboard a Pivot Less, a small brand out of Tempe, Arizona. No more for its full suspension lineup. Owner Chris Kakalis told us about how he approached making a light and fast hardtail. By the way, excuse the background noise in this interview, the booth across the Pivot booth decided to do a giveaway just as we started the interview. How, how long's Pivot been around now? Uh, I believe coming up on 17 years this fall. So. 17 years. So you've always had a hardtail in the lineup, I would gather. No. I mean, the reason the name of the company is Pivot is we actually have pivots on our bikes for the most part. Um, and then hence the Pivot Less. So <laughs> no pivots. And uh, yeah, so it was actually both the Dirt Jump bike um, and the... Uh, and the less were were developed for racers um, because we we needed a hardtail for our cross country racers beyond just a full suspension bike. So, funny thing, Chris, about hardtails is they kind of get thrown in this generic box. Like, well, hardtails are just hardtails, right? They've kind of become this vanilla thing to a lot of people with all the fancy suspension going on, including yourself. You have great suspension bikes. Yep. But tell me, is a hardtail just a hardtail? Oh, it isn't. Uh, it actually, in some ways, the development of the hardtail is a more, uh, more difficult project in that there's ride tuning. It, the bike needs to absorb and have suspension in, in and of itself. It needs to be stiff in the right places. And obviously, on, in, if you're running a hardtail, weight is a key reason, and, and having a, a super light bike is very important in that respect. Yeah, so tell me how you took some of those thoughts and put that into the pivot less what did you do there well all of our bikes regardless of a suspension bike or or a hardtail or a gravel bike all need to have certain ride quality to them there's certain things that make a pivot a pivot and make it snappy and lively and uh feel fast and and be fast and um and with carbon fiber specifically you can do a lot of different things and well, oftentimes when you start to get a bike really light with um, higher modulus materials, it can get stiff and less durable as well. And uh, anything we develop, we need to really be able to handle a World Cup cross-country course, which, as everybody knows, has gotten much more brutal and difficult and technical. I mean, some of the sections oftentimes now, they're going down some of the downhill World Cup course sections, um, and we need bikes that can, can handle that. So that the development, the layup, the time that it takes per bike size to get everything tuned in is just a, a, a longer, more exhaustive process, honestly, than it is on a suspension bike. So if I were to throw a leg over a pivot less and ride it, what would you tell me are some of the things I would probably feel or notice about that bike? Well, it kind of gives back your energy. I mean, it, it, it's super stiff in the bottom bracket, but it doesn't beat you up. It allows you to go faster through the bumps. Basically absorbs the bumps vertically, but allows you to sprint out. And uh, and it's it's among probably one of the three lightest hardtails in the world. It sounds Goldilocks yeah. almost, right? I mean, it, it, it does. Uh, for your athletes, um, where do they lean as far as, because you have a great, right, cross country race bike that's full suspension. How do they pick one over the other? Well, it's really course dependent. Uh, a lot of times, if there if there is a lot of smooth climbing or a lot of sprinting sections, 
Uh, there might still be technical se rocky sections, but it's it's not where they're going to make up time or not so technical that they're going to lose time, and they just have an advantage of being essentially fully locked out or, or close to it, and that's where lightweight and steep climbs uh, have can have the advantage. How did you try and make the bike behave as far as descending is concerned? And with Leadville in mind, it's very choppy, right? High speed, rough descent is most of what you're going to see at Leadville. Yeah, the bike in general kind of follows a lot of our trail bikes. When we did our last version of the last, the previous generation, when we came out with it, people were a little shocked at how slack the head angle was. Now that is not a slack head angle, but uh, um, this kind of took that to the next level of a longer reaches, slacker head angle, a little bit steeper seat angle, and basically makes it just a more confident descender. And then all those things in the ride tuning, being able to pick up the bumps and not have it skitter around and hop around uh, when it's going through that stuff. The tube sizes are very small. The frame is optimized really for each size rider. So every size frame has different tube shapes, different cross sections. And that's all to really enable each size rider at each kind of weight category to have a comfortable ride out of that bike. Right, uh, Hannah Otto is one of your riders, not a tall woman. How, what's, what are the size differences that you can accommodate? Yeah, so she uh, rides an extra small. She's at the upper limit for height. She, uh, she likes that, that size and the com compactness of that frame. But uh, we usually can take riders down to about 4'10". And uh, up to six seven, okay. so cool. big range. Cool. Um, now tell me about buying a less. Uh, how is it spec? Is there one spec? Do you have multiple specs? Uh, pretty much all pivot bikes come in three different levels of builds. We have Ride Pro and Team, and each of those is available in either a SRAM or a Shimano build. So uh, really six builds with some options like carbon wheels on the pro level builds. Uh, the lightest, the lightest builds are coming down on in, in, in XTR team build is is into the 20 pound 21 pound range um super light and are you both rock shocks and fox or fox on everything fox on everything okay. yeah um now where can i get a pivot uh well we can you can only get them through pivot retailers and so we have about 350 retailers in the u.s and dealers all over the globe so there's a lot of opportunities to look on our website there's a dealer locator and uh and then we also have demo events too okay cool but nothing direct from the company you got to go through a deal yeah nothing direct from the company okay, good support the bike shop yeah, right absolutely yeah. well we hope to see some pivots i know we'll see at least one pivot at leadville and hopefully many more and long live the hardtail right long live the hardtail ah yes long live the hardtail the high-end build goes for 95.99 you can get a build with carbon wheels starting at 73.99 we have also seen frames on the market for under 2500 Yeah, a frame set from of the Pivot Less might not be a bad choice here. Now, to what might be the hardest category, and that is a budget Leadville-worthy bike. If you're trying to keep your bike budget at something less than 2500 we found something in the Marin booth at Sea Otter. John Oldale with Marin helped us pick out a hardtail that should get the job done at Leadville. The reason why we stopped at Marin is... And I have John Oldale here with me. He's with Moraine. He's going to answer some questions for us. Is that Steve from Hardtail Party, who we've had on the show, highly recommended a bike that, that Marin has, and it's the Team Marin. Um, and so I thought we'd come by and speak to John about what that bike's about and, and who it might be for. So, John, thanks for being on the show. Uh, tell us about the Team Marin. Like, what type of bike is it? Why is it do what it does? Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me. Um, so, yeah, the, the Team Marin, uh, you know, at, at I think we need to start with uh, one of the foundations of the brand. And for us, we are Marin bikes made for fun. That is our mantra. Uh, we don't typically get involved in out and out race bikes, uh, you know, whether on a roadside, a gravel side or a mountain bike side. We, we don't even really sponsor any races. Um, but what we do like to do is make bikes that are, are super playful, super capable. Uh, and we realized that there was a bit of a gap in the market that we needed some sort of XC race bike that you could also take out and go and have some fun on some trails, maybe hit the pump track on the way home if you wanted. And so we came up with our version of a XC race bike, which is the Team Marin. Uh, comes in two different specs. Uh, it's a super capable bike. If you want to go out and do the Leadville, it's absolutely perfect 
you know, it comes stock, it comes with tubeless ready tires and rims, uh, it has a one by drivetrain, um, it has a relatively short back end, so 425, uh, and then a, a 67 degree head angle, which is, for us, that's a fine line, you know, you're still going to be able to be out all day on it riding some single track, but should you get to a little bit of downhill or something you want to be a little bit more aggressive on, that 67 degree head angle is going to come in and allow allow you to do that. Uh, we also spec both bikes uh, with a dropper post. They come with a dropper post ready to go. So, you know, that gives you a bit of a bit of an idea of what we, we think customers might like to do with this bike. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I guess probably what we're trying to do with this bike is we know that some people like to race on a Saturday, but they, they can't have one specific race bike. They, they want one mountain bike they can do everything on. And for us, that is the team we're in. And, and I think the other reason, one of the reasons I'm here is you're not going to break the bank with this bike. This is something that if somebody is trying not to spend tens of thousands of dollars on a bike, they can get something that's that's race ready or they can yep. handle something like Leadville without Yep, yep, without absolutely. emptying their bank account. Yeah, so we we come we have two different specs. So uh, there's the team team we're in one, which is one thousand four hundred and ninety nine USD, uh, and then we also have the team we're in two, which is two thousand four hundred and ninety nine USD. Um, the big big difference there is that you kind of you go you jump up quite a lot in, with the suspension fork, so you go from a Judy up to a Fox thirty four step cast. Uh, so you're getting a, quite a bit more technology in that fork. How, that being said, the Judy is more than capable of, of handling uh, a bit of aggro as well. Right. Um, this is an aluminum frame. It is. It is a, an aluminum frame. Yeah, we, we really try to focus on aluminum bikes at, at Marin. Okay. All right. There's, you know, uh, aluminum has gotten maybe overshadowed, maybe passed up by carbon, and a lot of people have decided that that's the way to go. Why does aluminum still work for you? And why do you think it can work in, in a lot of disciplines and a lot of races? So, so a, a big a big thing for us with aluminum is 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 its end of life. It's fully recyclable, which at the moment is not really easy to do with carbon. The other thing with carbon is you pay a lot of extra money in order to open tools in which you, you use these tools to form the shape of the carbon frame. And that that's all money that's being that then needs to be recouped in the retail price. So Equally, aluminum's come a long way in the last 10 years. There's some really cool technology going on with aluminum. So we're able to make a very stiff bike um, out, of, out of much more cost effective aluminum tubing. Um, so that, that's, that's why we go with aluminum. What kind of tire clearance can we get on the Team Marin? So it comes with a 2.35 tire. Uh, you can you can definitely ride. So I, as you can probably tell from my voice, I'm from the UK. So, uh, you know, a big thing for us is mud clearance. Um, and I can definitely tell you that with a 2.35, 2.4, you're still getting plenty of mud clearance. Should should that be something you're looking for? Right. Okay, good. That's, I mean, that's good. So a lot of people just like to spec a little larger tire, especially on a hardtail, just because that, that'll help with their suspension piece. Yeah, yeah. And the team marine is yeah yeah and and the other to that point the other thing is it comes with uh it comes with tubeless ready rims uh and on the team marine too with tires ready to go so all you need to do is fit the sealant uh and that's also going to allow you to have that little bit extra comfort because you can play around with tire pressures a little bit more than you can with an inner tube yeah uh if somebody mounts a team marine what should what kind of ride are they should they expect out of a bike like that well, I, I guess you can have a couple of things going on. So if you want to go fast and far, it's more than capable of that. But equally, if you want to ride a little bit of rowdy single track, maybe at a bit of pace, uh, it's more than capable of that. Uh, again, just to highlight, it does have that 67 degree head angle, 120 mil of suspension on the front fork, which is, is a lot more, is a lot slacker in the head angle and a little bit more suspension than you would get in an out and out XC race bike. Mm -hmm. So you're telling me it, it should be able to handle choppy rough terrain once i get in because leadville offers us a lot of these high speed descents where things are quite rough yeah the bike's going to be stable in those areas it, it is yes yeah, yep. yeah. Yep. okay yeah so the team we're in we got two versions fun colors too so yeah i mean all our colors are fun <laughs> uh at, at the moment the team Marine one is is kind of a uh a, a brushed it's it's brushed silver it's it's a silver and then the team Marine two is a black okay very good
Well, thanks thanks again for showing off your hardtail. We appreciate it. We need we still need hardtails, right? I mean, yeah, the hardtail's not dead, is it? No, no. Yeah. I personally, I'm a big believer in hardtails. So, okay. yeah, I love them. All right, thanks again for being on the show. No worries. That's right. The hardtail definitely is not dead. For more on the team we're in, go to the Hardtail Party YouTube channel and check out Steve's in-depth review. He really was impressed with the bike's capability and ride quality. All right, Fatty, that closes out our bike shopping spree. There are other brands and models that could also make this list, and I'm sure we'll hear about them. But hey, this was just one guy with a mic roaming Sea Otter. So I think we found some good choices here. Thanks to the companies who agreed to talk to us because there were a few that could not find the time. Hey, if you like the show, go to wherever you listen and give us a five-star rating and write a review. To see all the ways you can find this podcast, head to leadville.fm. Good luck in your training. Good luck in your bike shopping. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in just a few short months at the starting line.